German, French, and Spanish each have something which English does not, namely grammatical gender. English does have gendered pronouns, like he and she, as well as some nouns which still have a gender, such as the fact that boats are often referred to as she. But in German, spoons are masculine and forks are feminine, so if you were referring to a fork, you wouldn't say it, but rather she. As bizarre as this seems for English speakers, it is actually the norm in most languages, and is proof of something which analytical psychologists call the syzygy. The syzygy refers to the fact that humans are psychologically predisposed to think in terms of masculine and feminine, and this forms one of the major dualities of the human mind, just as the shadow archetype causes us to think in terms of good and evil. In biological terms, since the other gender is our means of passing on our genes, the psyche is genetically equipped to make the distinction between man and woman, and to treat the opposite gender in a special light, granting them a special importance, just as the psyche is equipped for the encounter with the mother, father, and antagonist. The syzygy causes us to see the other gender in a different way, almost as though there were something magical about them. As Jung writes, An inherited collective image of woman exists in a man's unconscious, with the help of which he apprehends the nature of woman. In men, this archetypal idea of the feminine is called the anima, and in women, the archetypal idea of the masculine is called the animus, and both tend to have a powerful influence over the psyche. As we will see, the archetypal ideas of the masculine and the feminine become the repository of contrasexual traits. The masculine and feminine principles, writes Anthony Stevens, are fundamental archetypes which have dominated the life of our species since its emergence, as indeed they have dominated the lives of our forebears long before our species evolved. Every archetype is essentially a pre-equipped psychic system which prepares the individual for some encounter which is likely to occur. The syzygy prepares a person for the encounter with the opposite gender, since a strong attraction to the opposite gender enables a species survival. This is why people's behavior is notably different when interacting with the opposite sex, since our minds are predisposed to make the distinction between our own gender and the other, and to treat the other gender in a specific way. In some sense, the psyche has a ready-made system for this encounter. As Jung writes, Every man carries within him the eternal image of woman, not the image of this or that woman, but a definite feminine image. This image is fundamentally unconscious, an hereditary factor of primordial origin, engraved in the living organic system of the man, an imprint or archetype of all the ancestral experiences of the female, a deposit, as it were, of all the impressions ever made by woman. He also writes, The whole nature of man presupposes woman, both physically and spiritually. His system is tuned into woman from the start, just as it is prepared for a quite definite world where there is water, light, air, salt, carbohydrates, etc. The form of the world into which he is born is already inborn in him as a virtual image. In the average man's mind, a woman is something fundamentally other to him and his psychology pushes him to treat women as such, and the same is true of men in women's eyes. In fact, these ideas are so inborn to the psyche that they can often appear in our dreams as seemingly autonomous beings. The syzygy allows us to select a mate when the anima or animus becomes projected onto a specific person, causing our minds to see them in an almost magical and numinous light, as though they were the most amazing person alive. When a man experiences passionate attraction to a woman, it is because she seems to embody his anima, and she appears to him more beautiful, more numinous than any other woman around, often to the stupefaction of his friends, who completely fail to understand what he sees in her. This serves the biological function of choosing the ideal romantic partner, but since the anima or animus exert a powerful influence over our minds, it may cause us to see our crush as being more perfect than they really are. This is what leads people into being obsessively infatuated, since the power of the syzygy can override their conscious rationality. This demonstrates one of the potentially negative sides of the anima or animus, since its influence over the psyche can cause us to think that we are in love, when really our unconscious minds are seizing control, possibly leading people into unhappy or even abusive relationships. However, if you read Jung's work, you may get the impression that the anima and animus 
are not merely instruments of sexual reproduction, but refers to unconscious masculinity and femininity. In order to understand this point, as well as the connection between the unconscious and sexuality, we will need to discuss human biological gender. Sex in humans is determined by our sex chromosomes. I say in humans because other animals, like turtles for example, have temperature-based sex determination, where the temperature of their eggs, after being laid, determines gender. For a person to be born female, they require one X chromosome from each parent, while males have an X chromosome from the mother and a Y chromosome from the father. Jung believed that men possessed female genes, which were masked by the male genes, but still contributed to his feminine traits. This belief turned out to be wrong, since the psychological differences between men and women don't seem to be related directly to genetics. For example, it is well known that women are more empathetic than men, and yet the genes said to be responsible for empathy are not connected to sex. This indicates that the psychological differences between men and women are likely due more directly to physiological, anatomical, and hormonal differences between them, rather than the direct effects of the sex chromosomes. There are numerous well-established psychological differences between men and women. In general, men are more aggressive, assertive, independent, and logical, while women are generally more emotional, empathetic, collaborative, and caring. It is worth noting that these differences are general trends, and not absolute differences, which is why exceptions exist. Jung believed that the chief differences between men and women can be broadly summarized as eros and logos. Eros refers to our emotional capacity, but also more specifically to our desire to form close, meaningful connections with others. Logos refers to our logical and rational way of thinking, which attempts to extricate itself of emotional influences and discriminate different elements of the world rather than drawing them together. Logos, unlike Eros, separates rather than connects. Femininity is more strongly characterized by the connective desire of Eros, while masculinity is associated with the distinguishing ability of Logos. Again, this difference is not absolute. As Jung writes, I use Eros and Logos merely as conceptual aids to describe the fact that woman's consciousness is characterized more by the connective quality of Eros than by the discrimination and cognition associated with Logos. In men, Eros, the function of relationship, is usually less developed than Logos. In women, on the other hand, Eros is an expression of their true nature. Both genders have the capacity for Eros and Logos, but Jung observed that one or the other tends to predominate. This means that the traits which are associated with the other gender tend to be repressed into the unconscious, where they still exert an influence over our conscious minds. The ego also plays a role in the repression of contrasexual traits into the unconscious. By contrasexual, we simply mean traits which are more associated with the opposite gender, although in actuality, there is nothing inherently gendered about psychological traits. The feminine side of a man and the masculine side of a woman become repressed due to the fact that the ego often puts its own gender as a central feature of the personality. Since the ego more often identifies with one gender, traits associated with the opposite gender are often masked and hidden in the unconscious, where they nevertheless influence the psyche. Again, these traits are only regarded as feminine or masculine by means of association, and are not inherently so. And so to say that the anima has feminine traits is just a useful way to speak about it, and not reflective of its inherent nature. Some people may have an ego which better identifies with the opposite gender, and so these traits, rather than being repressed, come to the forefront, which is why some men are more outwardly feminine, and some women are more outwardly masculine. However, it is more common that the egos of both men and women are identified with their biological genders, and everything in them which is associated with the opposite gender is projected outwards. No man is so entirely masculine that he has nothing feminine in him. The fact is, rather, that very masculine men have, carefully guarded and hidden, a very soft emotional life, often incorrectly described as feminine. A man counts it a virtue to repress his feminine traits as much as possible, just as a woman, at least until recently, considered it unbecoming to be mannish. The repression of feminine traits and inclinations naturally causes these contrasexual demands to accumulate in the unconscious. No less naturally, the imago of woman, the soul image, becomes a receptacle for these demands, 
which is why a man, in his love choice, is strongly tempted to win the woman who best corresponds to his own unconscious femininity. A woman, in short, who can unhesitatingly receive the projection of his soul. In other words, we often seek a romantic partner who embodies our unconscious contrasexual traits, and project these traits onto our partners, when really they belong to ourselves. We thus often choose a partner who best represents our unconscious femininity or masculinity, although oftentimes we just assume that our prospective partners possess these traits without actually knowing. In general, this is how we decide whether a person is a good match for us, and our unconscious archetype is responsible for the feeling of connection we experience when we have chemistry with our partners. It is therefore likely an evolutionary tool for selecting a person with whom we are compatible. A woman is attracted to a man who possesses the masculine qualities of her animus. A man is drawn to a woman who seems to carry the feminine qualities of his anima. The power of the archetypes explains how people can become infatuated to the point of neurotic fixation, as though they were being taken over by some mysterious force. Many psychological problems are caused by the inability to disengage one's anima or animus from the person onto whom it is being projected, especially when the other person is uninterested, or even worse, if they are toxic. Apart from being projected outwards onto other people, the anima and animus have important psychological functions pertaining to the individual, since they exist within us and thereby influence our minds. The anima and animus represent two different psychological attitudes towards the world. The anima sees connections between things, whereas the animus sees distinctions. The anima is better attuned towards living beings and personal relationships, whereas the animus is more attuned to inanimate objects such as tools. The animus in women is often projected outwards towards men, who seem to embody a woman's unconscious masculinity, but it also acts in contrast to a woman's eros. Recall earlier that the anima is characterized by eros, while the animus is characterized by logos. Logos in a woman is responsible for her rational faculties, rather than her emotional ones, and allows her to think logically, discriminating between different parts of the world in order to find differences and contrasts between things. This means that a woman's consciousness, generally speaking, is dependent upon her masculine side. However, since Eros is usually dominant in a woman, her consciousness is often colored by Eros, meaning that the boundary between consciousness and the unconscious is less firm in women than in men, allowing a woman to experience her unconscious more directly. In other words, the unconscious in women plays a more active part in shaping their consciousness and gives rise to the fact that women are, in general, more emotional than men. In a previous video, I discussed how the unconscious can be characterized as feminine while consciousness is masculine, and this is true regarding the syzygy as well. Women in general are more attuned to their unconscious minds, for which reason they are more in tune with their emotional side, just as men are more logos driven, and therefore utilize consciousness to a much greater extent. The animus is needed for a woman's consciousness, and the development of her ego also depends upon this masculine element. Even if a woman's ego has a feminine character, as is often the case, the ability of her ego to differentiate itself from others and pass through the various stages of ego development requires that she utilize her masculine side. A woman's heroic journey depends upon her otherwise underutilized masculine side. Women by nature are better at forming empathetic connections with others, but for a woman to strive towards independence of will requires that her animus steer the ship of the psyche rather than being absorbed by her passive eros. This is why women in general are more passive than men, because the conscious function of the animus, which is much more active, is frequently repressed into the unconscious, where it becomes projected onto men. This leads to the common situation, where the man receiving the projection dictates a woman's fate, and in a sense becomes her logos. Psychological transformation for a woman often involves withdrawing the animus from projection, and letting it embody her psyche giving her a sense of free will and the capacity for self-determination. Ambitious women who seek challenging goals must experience their animus in order to do so, otherwise they will be passively carried along by their instinctual emotions, rather than rising above them. Since Logos divides rather than connects, her Logos allows her to grant more agency to herself, 
so that she can find her own way, apart from the wills imposed upon her by others. While this can be useful for a woman when overcoming adversity, it may also lead to a state of animus possession, as Anthony Stevens writes. When integrated with the conscious personality, it can enable a woman to achieve her goals in life and further her own individuation. However, should she become unconsciously identified with it, or possessed by it, the result can be a demonic organization lady who tyrannizes and manipulates her underlings so as to implement her will. As with any archetype, it functions best when there is a balance between projection and possession, and being conscious of the animus can help a woman identify when either state is causing problems. The crucial factor in Jung's view was that the animus should be harmoniously integrated with the rest of the personality, and should not become so powerful as to shake the woman's affirmation of her biological identity. Although the animus is used in being conscious, a dynamic interaction between the masculine and feminine portions of the psyche can lead to a higher state of consciousness, since the anima bridges the conscious mind to the unconscious, a critical fact which we will now examine in the context of male psychology. If masculinity is the gateway to consciousness, then femininity is the gateway to the unconscious, and such is the case with respect to a man's anima. While the anima is most often found as being projected upon a beautiful woman, the anima can also affect a male psyche and act as a bridge to his unconscious mind, and therefore to his more emotional side. This happens when a man lets go of the reins of his masculine ego consciousness, which, with its heightened sense of rationality and logic, disregards the emotionality of Eros. This is why the experience of ego death is usually followed by an experience of one's anima. The Logos principle is good at logically discriminating between things, a characteristic feature of consciousness, and it is this capacity which allows us to consciously direct the psyche. But when one sinks into his unconscious mind, whenever the ego momentarily dissolves, he experiences Eros and its connective emotional capacity. When a man experiences his anima, his emotional side comes out, and he will often express his vulnerability. And many men can relate to the experience of encountering his emotional side, especially after a significant psychological transformation. This encounter is often rejuvenating and reaffirming, because it allows us to connect with the deeper portions of the psyche, for which reason the word anima, which means soul, was the name given by Jung to this archetype. This state of heightened emotional receptivity enables a person to reach deeper insights, which his ordinary conscious mind is often excluded from, due to its disregard of information which challenges its pre-established paradigm. Emotions allow us to experience life, rather than merely observing it with our rational consciousness. For this reason, the anima plays a crucial role in creativity. In no realm of human endeavor is the contrasexual complex more crucial than that of creativity. The achievements of men as prophets, seers, artists, and creative thinkers is not entirely attributable to the law of greater variability of masculine talents or to testosterone-driven powers of perseverance. It is also dependent upon the successful adoption of a receptive attitude to ideas and symbols emerging from normally unconscious regions of the personality. Hence the emphasis on gestation and incubation made by innovative men when they describe their methods of work and the manner by which their major insights came to birth. The masculine conscious mind, though useful for guiding our actions, is often too rigid to the point where it stops a person from considering other points of view, whereas the feminine anima is more capable of accepting ambiguity. The anima, acting as a bridge to the unconscious mind, is less rational and therefore more free to think beyond the confines of their typical experience. The unconscious mind is filled with fantasy images, which are normally disregarded in today's rationalistic world. But the realm of fantasy is the birthplace of new ideas, which often stand in contrast to what is generally accepted by the spirit of the times. The insights of the unconscious don't feel like consciously directed thoughts, but almost like passively received messages which enables our minds to access ideas which we don't normally consider, and come to deeper understandings. This is why the unconscious is able to lead people to higher insights, which can then be integrated with consciousness, and why the dynamic relationship between consciousness and the unconscious is what has enabled the psychological evolution of the human species. For example, a man may learn to be more empathetic 
and consider other people's point of view, when he becomes embodied by his anima. This state of mind is also how we form connections with others, in order to strengthen our bonds, in contrast to the more individualistic attitude of masculinity. This makes sense, since another person can often open us up to ideas and possibilities we would never have considered. This incredible fact is captured beautifully by Jung. It is just the most unexpected, the most terrifying chaotic things which reveal a deeper meaning. When sense and nonsense are no longer identical, the force of chaos is weakened by their subtraction. Sense is then endued with the force of meaning, and nonsense with the force of meaninglessness. In this way, a new cosmos arises. Jung often described the anima as not merely a function, but something which had a living presence in the psyche, as though it were an autonomous entity living inside our minds. This emphasis enables us to see the extent to which the anima influences male psychology, and just like the animus, it can exert a possessive influence over our minds, as emotionality often leads to irrationality. In extreme cases, dissolving the boundaries between conscious and unconscious can lead to psychosis, since the ego is no longer in control of the psyche. As stated before, we shouldn't reject the masculine or feminine within us, but rather find balance between these two poles, since both have important functions, and both can be destructive if taken too far. As with all archetypes, their influence over the mind gives rise to mythological conceptions. We encounter the anima, historically above all, in the divine syzygies, the male-female pairs of deities. These reach down, on the other side, into the obscurities of primitive mythology, and up onto the other, into the philosophical speculations of Gnosticism and of classical Chinese philosophy, where the cosmogonic pair of concepts are designated as yang, masculine, and yin, feminine. It is important to note that these archetypes are ever-present factors in the psyche, and can simply be removed. Their influence is constant and unconditional. With respect to projections, the influence of the anima and animus is incredibly strong, so much so that people who cheat on their partners could in all honesty be said to have been lured by their archetypal natures. Hence, effectively utilizing these archetypes also entails knowing when their suggestive influence is at play, so that we may be able to extricate ourselves of their strength and avoid ruining our relationships. Each archetype has a negative and positive aspect, whether they are projected outwards or inwards, and optimal psychological health demands that a person recognize the dual nature of these primordial influences. Archetypes are also not totally clear-cut and distinguishable from each other. For instance, a boy's anima is often projected onto his mother in early life, and the same is true of young girls and their fathers. Later, a need arises to extricate the anima and animus from their respective parental projections so that they can be utilized for finding a romantic partner. The shadow and syzygy also tend to get mixed together, since they result from repression, and so the anima is often encountered as the positive side of the shadow, usually being discovered after encountering the darkness of the shadow. However, though they can be given a degree of energy, such to be felt directly, such as when a man becomes emotional or a woman becomes heroic, the syzygy nevertheless constantly influences us from the unconscious. When utilized properly, the male and female aspects of the psyche play different roles which can enrich our lives. The male side allows us to strive for self-determination and agency, as we pursue the freedom to be the masters of our own fate. The female side enables us to feel a sense of purpose, meaning, and wonderment in the universe, as well as allowing us to form deep, life-enriching connections. Balance between these two aspects is the key which can enable personal development and optimal psychological health to the benefit of both the individual and society at large. In fact, this idea of the union of masculine and feminine principles forms one of the oldest conceptions in religion, that of the sacred marriage between the masculine and feminine deity, and is also played out in the union of man and wife in the tradition of marriage. Just as a man and woman unite in marriage, so too must each individual unite masculine and feminine within themselves.